Hey, Internet. So today I want to talk to you about OpenAI's new model, 4.1, and what this model reveals about the future of prompting. So not just the model was released, but they also released a guide. And this guide actually talks through best practices for how to prompt this specific model. And what I want to do in this video is I want to talk to you about not just the best practices from this blog post, but also what this blog post means for old best practices for prompting and how the prompting as a, as a practice in itself, a craft, is evolving over time as the models get better. And uh, with that being said, let's get into it. So this is uh, our super cool, awesome anime of the day from OpenAI. Thank you, GPT. I guess zero, 4.0, or something like that. So we're gonna start with uh, these items here that I wanna walk you through from the blog post. And I'll I'll share all the resources that I mentioned here um, that I call out both in relation to the guide and also other things that I mentioned. All right, so we'll start here at the top and we'll work our way down. Now, the first thing here is uh, instruction following. So this is one of the primary things that they talk through in their post and the importance of an instruction following uh, is, is critical for all types of things. And uh, the primary thing that I want to call it here for instruction uh, following is that oftentimes in the past, when we would uh, best practice for getting a model to do what you wanted it to do, is you'd kind of pull out all these crazy tricks to either like do all caps and yell at it or create some sort of convoluted scenario saying, if you aren't able to do this, then somebody will die or uh, bribing it saying, you know, if, if you do this, I'll give you a million dollars or something like that. And some of these actually worked. There were studies that were written around these types of prompting tactics and how models were more effective in following certain tasks and doing certain things. But now with 4.1 and also Gemini 2.5 Pro and Claude 3.7, these newer models, this newer kind of cohort of models, they're a lot better at following instructions. You don't have to do all these crazy convoluted tasks to get them to do something very specific, which is, which is great to see and also amazing to not have to yell at models. Uh, the next thing here is context window. So this is the first model that OpenAI has released that has such a big context window, which is 1 million, 1 million input, I think. And the really cool thing about this is specifically for those that are using AI to develop, uh, if you're using cursor, so we'll do C for cursor and we'll do WF for windsurf, these two types of IDEs that are ID, AI-centric IDEs, they have these types of rules. And let me actually walk you through what this is. So each one of these boxes, these can represent applications that we're building. So these are different projects we're working on with these different tools. So our first project here has uh, project roles. And I think Windsurf has the same thing. I use mainly cursor, but I'm pretty sure they're similar. So they have project rules, and then you have a subset of global rules. So we'll go above here and we'll say GR for global rules. And global rules are basically rules that the AI should follow um, in all the projects. Project rules are very specific to that project. So if you're using a specific lang language, a certain framework, et cetera. Oftentimes from my experience, most models really, really suck at following the global rules. And the reason they suck at following the global rules is when they're working on a project, say project three, the context is so big that it actually loses the thread. So it loses the fact that there are global rules in the first place because it's, its memory and its brain is so full of everything else that it can't reach those global rules. So from my experience, Gemini 2.5 Pro is the first model that has consistently referenced the global rules that I've had in my cursor subset. Um, period going forward. So this is a really good breakthrough for a lot of us AR, AI developers, because we can actually have these global rules and they can be referenced and they can improve our ability to one shot different parts of an application so we can build it without too many errors. So this is a big plus. So I recommend using Gemini 2.5 Pro or even um, now GPT 4.1 for those improved ability to actually reference those rules. So that's the one thing I wanted to share there for the context. Um, next is negating terms. So when we look at best practices from the past, um, a lot of people would avoid using negating terms. So a negating term is saying, do not do this ever, or never do X or not, etc. So you're basically saying not to do something. And the reason we wouldn't do that in system prompts is that the uh, AI would accidentally do that thing that you didn't want it to do because it was inside of the system prompt. And when that happens, um, we actually are obviously doing the exact opposite of what we want it to do. And if you can hear construction in the background, sorry about that. Um, anyways, so the cool thing now is that it's okay to use these negating terms. We're allowed to say not to do something or to avoid something or to never do something because the AI's ability to follow that instruction has improved with models like 4.1 and 2.5 Pro. And then the last thing here is delimiters. Now with a model, when you're writing a prompt, we'll do another image here. So say this is our prompt and we're writing all this stuff here. 
So in our prompt, we usually want the AI to segment the prompt into certain sections because certain sections have certain purposes. So say we have section one, two, and three, and each has its own purpose. So the model should actually know that section one has a different purpose than two and three inside of the system prompt. And to do that, we would usually use delimiters. So that can be markdown, which is usually hashtags and other things. Either it could be XML, which is a little bracket thingies like this, or different th types of things like that. And in the blog post for prompting, OpenAI actually said that XML has actually performed the best when it comes to system prompts that have a lot of context and are more complicated. And this is interesting because Claude, Anthropic, the company that made Claude, they actually used XML for a while. So their models have always been good at XML and there seems to be a convergence happening. So if OpenAI, Anthropic, and probably other model providers that are building models, they're all starting to converge on the usage of XML and system prompts because of its effectiveness and having the model follow those instructions and segment them effectively. So this isn't necessarily going to be forever, but it's interesting how this is happening where people are converging on the usage of a certain type of delimiter inside of the system prompt. All right, so let me quickly look at the, these are some of my notes for everything I just mentioned above. I wanna make sure I didn't miss anything. Nope, we're good, nice. All right, so the next thing I wanna mention, uh, so this is actually a snapshot, a screenshot from the, I think the main blog post they made uh, about this new model, not the guide itself for prompting, but they did call it some interesting bits that I wanted to share with you. So the uh, format following we've already talked about, the negation we've already talked about, order instructions is interesting and also re-ranking is interesting. These are kind of similar, where with ordered instructions in the system prompt, you can say first do X, then do Y, then do Z. This historically has been kind of hard for a model to do effectively in a row. So now it's actually more effective in its ability to follow those instructions, which is important, except, especially for agents. Um, re-ranking is basically sorting something afterwards, which is, I would say, similar to ordering or at least uh, the concept behind it. Uh, content requirements. So this kind of goes back to the all cap situation. So instead of having to say always, like uh, like freaking out and yelling at it and saying always do X, you don't have to have all caps. Instead, you can do it as a normal person would. And it'll always reference that specific item inside of the thing you're asking it to do. And then overconfidence. This is another really important for agents or specifically rag use cases. So oftentimes you have your, uh, your robot here. So this is a robot. We'll draw some a smiley face. And we have our database here. And for RAG, the AI is asked a question, and see, we have a human here, really bad human. And they, they ask a, the, a human asks the robot a question, the robot then has to reference the database to get the information. So oftentimes what we would do is if the robot would accidentally say something that wasn't in the database, that would be considered a hallucination because it's not referencing the information we asked it for. And uh, oftentimes in system prompts for these agent use cases that are using RAG, you would ask it to say, I don't know if it doesn't know the answer. And this is a form of grounding. And this is an old uh, best practice in prompting where you would actually get the model to do a grounding technique saying that, if the answer is not in the database, then then either give them nothing back or tell them that you don't know. But never ever go outside of your knowledge, go outside of the knowledge base that you're referencing into your own knowledge base. So it's kind of internal versus external knowledge. But now with instruction following, the model is much more effective at doing this. So you can simply say, just say, I don't know. And there's a high likelihood that the model will effectively do that instead of hallucinate, which is yet again, another plus for RAG setups and also overall kind of system uh, agents. All right, so we've talked about this. Now we're gonna go over here really quick. So this is also from the prompt guide that OpenAI shared. And this is kind of the beginner 101 setup where if you're not necessarily sure of how to start, you wanna reference this uh, structure for a basic system prompt structure. And this is kind of, many, many people have talked about this before. It's not anything new, but I wanted to just touch on it briefly so everybody kind of knows what it is. So at the very top of your prompt, you're gonna have the role. So this is kind of the persona you've given it saying you're, you're X, you're Y. So you're a professional writer, you're a coder, et cetera. You give it a task or they say objective. So some people call this a task, some people call it an objective. So this is the thing we want you to achieve. Uh, next, we have those instructions that it's so good at following. So we can give it instructions and not just instructions of doing X, Y, and Z. We can also give it subcategories. So more specific detail below each one of those instructions around the specificity of how to execute those instructions over time. Um, also, we can give it reasoning steps, and it's important to note that this model, GPT-4.1, is not a reasoning model, but it's a generative model, so we actually have to bake in the reasoning into the system prompt. So this way, we're basically saying at the very end of a prompt, saying think step by step. And not only do we say think step by step, we can actually specify what we mean by think step by step. What specific things am I going to think about for each one of those steps and what order? So we can actually specify what that reasoning looks like. 
Uh, next, we have the output format, which is the XML thing I mentioned previously. And then we have the uh, examples. So this is kind of, this is called few shot learning. So we're giving it examples of what it should look like when it responds. And this increases its likelihood of effectively responding. And then last, we have the context. And, and actually not last, but second to last. An important thing to mention here is that the context, even though it's just one line inside of the system prompt, uh, proportionally, so if we just draw like a big box here, at the very top is going to be our instructions. So our instructions are all of this stuff we just mentioned, examples included, it's all gonna fit in there. And then at the very bottom, we're gonna reiterate those instructions, but in between, we're gonna have all this information and all this is gonna be context. Depending on your use case, you might not have this much context, but some use cases do. So we can have this huge context section um, inside of our prompt, and we're gonna have to do two things. So we're gonna have our instructions at the top and also we're gonna have them at the bottom. And the reason we're gonna do top and bottom is actually in the, the prompt guide that they share in best practices, they say that it's important to have your instructions and to repeat them at the top and the bottom. And I probably, you probably can't see this because my face is in the way. So I'll zoom out a bit and do this maybe. Uh, yeah, that's a little better. All right, so, um, and the reason we're doing this is that the likelihood of the model understands and remembers the instructions because the context window is so big is it's, it's a lot higher if you put the instructions at the top and not all of them, you don't have to copy and paste them from the top and the bottom. You just wanna kind of re-emphasize re the really critical instructions and the thinking step-by-step -step uh, part at the very bottom of the piece. Um, also, they state that uh, in their best practices, if you don't want to do both top and bottom, if you had to choose one, they say to actually just go with the top, and that has performed more effectively than going with uh, the bottom versus the top. Now, the interesting thing about this that I wanted to call out, which is a bit of a side rant, is in the past, um, OpenAI has historically talked about um, caching. And so is Claude and other types of providers. And this, the reason they do this is because this saves money for uh, people that are building with these tools. And the caching method that OpenAI has pushed for in the past has actually stated that you should put all of the uh, stuff in your system prompt that is static, something that doesn't change over time. So either this is a specific instruction that's always the same, or it's a piece of context that's always the same. And you put this at the very top of your prompt. You can see by this kind of color coding here is that everything at the top of the prompt here is static, it doesn't change. And by doing this, you cache this information so the model doesn't have to rethink about all of this stuff every single time, so you save yourself a lot of money on inference. So this kind of is a way to save money but still get good quality. But the interesting thing though, is that with this new, this, uh, this new best practice that they're referencing over here of putting both your instructions at the top and the bottom, it's negating that caching point so you're not necessarily saving as much. So I don't know if they're shifting their tactics or shifting their perspectives here, um, or maybe it's just uh, one model is different than the other. But either way, it's interesting to kind of compare what they've said in the past to what they're saying now for different types of models. So I don't know if this whole caching thing is going to change or that this is just a nuance for GPT 4.1 and the caching thing still applies for all the other models. All right, so with that being said, that is mainly what I wanted to talk about for prompting. So everything we've talked about here, these are all the big points when it comes to um, how prompting is changing and evolving and how a lot of the things we used to do in the past are becoming somewhat obsolete with these newer models, which is kind of cool to see. So one quick thing I wanted to do, so this is another side rant, is actually um, talking through some benchmarks. So oftentimes when the, these model providers, when they talk about their models, they want to make them look as good as possible, which is, which is fair, which is fine. And what they'll do is sometimes they'll compare themselves to their past self or they'll compare themselves to other model providers through a very specific benchmark. And what I wanted to do is show you that if you look at the best models in the market today, Gemini 2.5 Pro is still probably by far the best when it comes to coding and a variety of other use cases that rely on a lot of long context. And I wanna give you some use cases and benchmarks uh, to kind of show why that's true. And also just from my own experience of vibe coding and, and working with these models. All right, so we're first going to look at this this um, benchmark here that is actually not talked about often. So this is um, this is called fiction.livebench. And what this specific benchmark is doing is interesting. So it's based off of fictional stories. And the example here is we want the model to be able to shove the entire story in its head and answer questions, not just about specific parts of the story, but a lot of interconnected pieces of the story. So our example here is say we've asked the model a question about a specific story. And the only way that the model can effectively answer this question is it has to it has to pull a fact from chapter two, has to pull a reference to that fact in chapter 18, and then it has to string all of those together, together in a methodical way to respond to us to get to a good get a good answer. Now, this is 
counter not this this is kind of the opposite or different from what a lot of these different model providers talk about when they talk about long context windows so this is something that openai talks a lot about on their um, video or when they talk through this is uh, needle in the haystack so this is often what people reference and this is referring to the model's ability to refer to a specific fact and a larger pile of data so if I have a huge book that talks about baking and I shove a fact in there about quantum physics, if the model can pick that fact out from the entirety of the book, that is considered perfect or good. And that's what this is showing here is basically this entire section is all blued off because it's showing that irrelevant of the input tokens and irrelevant of the depth of the needle, it's always going to get it. So it's basically perfect, which is cool, but it's not necessarily useful. And the reason it's not useful is oftentimes when you and I are using these models, we have really complex use cases that have not just finding a specific fact in a, in a data set, but it's more about understanding the data set, understanding the complexities of the data set and the interconnected pieces for it, and then being able to cohesively understand that and solve a problem with that data set in the AI's head. So that's why if we look at this benchmark, we can see that if we compare all the different models, and this was, I think, done only a few days ago, um, we can see that Gemini 2.5 Pro is listed here and it has the by far the best score out of all the different models and this is only for 120k tokens not the larger um, spectrum but my guess is that since it's at such a high mark it's probably better than the rest when we extend this out for more tokens and you can see uh, gemini 4.1 is down here which is at 62 which is still pretty good um, but we can see that grok me mini is better than 62. we can see weirdly that gemini 4.0 is actually uh yeah better than gemini 4.1 um, and we have cloud 3.7 which is at 53 so we have different scores here but by far gemini 2.5 pro is still the best um, so that's just one interesting thing on that piece that i wanted to call out when it comes to the context and the ability of using that context not just finding facts but also uh, stringing those facts together to answer complex questions and then another thing i wanted to share here is i think this is uh, for tool calling and for tool calling you can see um, that Gemini 2.5 Pro is again listed as the best on this benchmark for uh, that was referenced inside of the OpenAI announcement. You can see 3.5 Sonnet is actually better than 3.7 Sonnet, which is interesting. When I use cursor sometimes, I actually reference 3.5 instead of 3.7 for execution. And then I use Gemini 2.5 Pro and uh, Cloud 3.7 thinking for the strategy. So what are we going to do? And then the executor is one of these models down here. And you can see uh, 4.1 is down here for tool calling, which isn't... Uh, comparably isn't as good as the others. So long story short is uh, Gemini, Gemini, no, sorry, ChatGPT 4.1 has made, made progress, really proud of them. Um, but at the same time, it's also still not the best model. So if you have different use cases that you want to code with, I still recommend using uh, Cloud 3.5 uh, or uh, Gemini 2.5 Pro, or even 3.7 from Cloud for the thinking side. And with that being said, internet, hope you enjoyed this. Uh, please do uh, reshare this with your friends if you did. And if you'd like to work with me, I have a company called Gradient Labs where we help people implement AI internally to increase your productivity. So if you're interested, there's a link below. You can book a free 30-minute call to see if there's a good fit between the two of us. And with that being said, Internet, I'll see you next time.